talk today will be about the plotting events following vaccination with uh, COVID-19, specifically the adenoviral vector-based vaccines, and really the uh, that's the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. And I would like to spend some time during this talk uh, more uh, about comparing and contrasting this uh, disease um, called, uh, or, or, or simplified as VIT, to a familiar disease which really gave us the indication of what this uh, uh, clotting event happening after the adenoviral vector vaccines uh, is based on what we already know and studied for over four decades um, called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT for an abbreviation. So I'll start off with uh, VIT, uh, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT, V-I-T-T, -T, is the name given to the new disease discovered in some patients following AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccination for COVID-19. It's a rare but serious adverse effect of adenoviral vector vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. The clinical picture of VIT is moderate to severe thrombocytopenia, and of course thrombocytopenia means low platelet count, together with arterial and or venous clotting thrombi. Often this occurs in unusual locations such as the, the brain and abdominal, but also in other uh, locations. These findings in VIT resemble the immunological drug reaction called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or as I mentioned, HIT. And this presents clinically as thrombocytopenia and thrombosis also in patients who have previously been exposed to heparin. And heparin, of course, is an anticoagulant that is administered for many um, uh, cl clinical and medical surgical uh, settings, such as heart surgery, uh, knee surgery, hip replacement surgery, et cetera. These patients uh, usually are always exposed to heparin, but VIT most closely resembles the exceptionally rare condition called spontaneous HIT, which is very hard to understand uh, because there's very, very few cases worldwide, and the spontaneous HIT cases occur in the absence of heparin. So it's like we had some sort of indication from way back when these spontaneous HIT cases appeared that there might be a problem in a new disease called VIT. VIT resembles HIT because it's associated with platelet activating antibodies against a self protein called platelet factor four. However, patients with the vaccine induced clotting disease develop thrombocytopenia and thrombosis with no exposure to heparin and the pattern of platelet reactivity activation in vitro in our tests does not does demonstrate what we typically see in HIT where the HIT patient samples will activate platelets in the presence of heparin usually. So several investigators like Andreas Geinacker from Germany and Marie Scully from the UK and a group from uh, the Nordic have demonstrated the presence of high levels of anti-PF4 antibodies in VIT samples. These antibodies can form platelet activating immune complexes without heparin, potentially being responsible for the thrombocytopenia and the clotting we see in this new disease. And the concept of heparin is at the core of the complexity of VIT because we don't understand how these antibodies on their own can form these immune complexes. While in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, you need that heparin. So our group took a molecular biology and biochemistry approach to understand how VIT patients can form these platelet-activating uh, immune complexes with PF4 in our circulation and in the absence of other polyanions such as heparin for uh, DNA and RNA and uh, platelet surfaces, et cetera. <clears throat> So I'll just uh, briefly go through some of the facts about platelet factor four. Um, it, it's a self protein called uh, PF, uh, abbreviated as PF4. It's highly cationic, referred to as CXCL4 chemokine. A monomer is about 7.8 kilodaltons in size, and it exists usually in equi equilibrium between a dimer and a tetramer. It has a highly positively charged equator around 
the, the, the molecule, the, the tetramer, which obviously is instrumental in binding the highly negatively charged heparin molecules. In fact, heparin is one of the most negatively charged biomolecules on Earth. PF4 is one of the most abundant proteins stored in the alpha granules of, activate, of platelets, and upon activation, they're secreted, and the level of uh, PF4 in circulation can go about can go up about can go up about a thousand fold, um, and so that's pretty dramatic. PF4 must be present in its tetrameric form to expose or form these antigens to which anti-PF4 heparin antibodies bind to from patients with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. In addition to its role in hemostasis, PF4 has many, bio uh, many biological effects, including in inflammation, angiogenesis, atherosclerosis, and antimicrobial action. Um, the reality is PF4's real job in our body is not really known, but it seems like it's involved in many different um, um, scenarios, and PF4 is the mostly studied in this disease, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So what is here? Let's take a look, closer look. And among the possible side effects during treatment with heparin is thrombocytopenia, or low platelet count, as I mentioned. And thrombosis is the most feared complication of heparin therapy. So HIT is an immune-mediated, prothrombotic, and potentially devastating complication of heparin therapy. And this is a paradox because these patients, the HIT patients, are in, in, a, surgical, in a surgical setting, such as uh, heart uh, surgery or knee surgery or hip surgery, and they're receiving an anticoagulant, which usually should stop uh, clotting, and they have thrombocytopenia, the platelets, their platelets are actually low, which usually leads to bleeding, not clotting. But here we are with a disease that actually leads to a clotting event and uh, potentially death. <clears throat> the overall incidence of HIT is estimated between 0.5 and 1% of all patients treated with either unfractionated heparin <clears throat> or low molecular weight heparin. Um, unfractionated heparin being the long chain uh, negatively charged molecules, low molecular weight heparin is uh, smaller sizes and, and it's, a, it's fractionated from the yeah, unfractionated. The numbers of affected patients are normally between, uh, are affected by different patient factors and drug factors. For instance, medical, uh, surgical patients will have more of HIT than medical patients, a tiny bit uh, more on the female side than the male side, and of course, unfractionated heparin um, more than low molecular weight heparin. So how does HIT happen? Well, many aspects about the pathophysiology that leads to HIT has been extensively studied. And upon exposure to heparin, certain individuals will mount an antibody response to these complexes of PF4 and heparin. And as I mentioned, PF4 is a chemokine in the platelet, platelets. And when they activate, the, the amount goes up. And what you end up with is the product, production of IgG-specific antibodies that bind complexes of PF4 and heparin, these are pretty large, and they lead to platelet activation, as we can see in, the, in, the, in this uh, figure. And the platelet activation releases more PF4, which binds more heparin, and you get this vicious cycle of prothrombotic uh, situation in the body uh, that activates other cells like endothelial cells and monocytes. It produces tissue factor, which activates the ca uh, coagulation cascade. And you get this firestorm of repetitive activation. <clears throat> so it's very important to mention that although many people exposed to heparin produce antibodies, only the IgG ones can actually activate uh, platelets and cause the disease. Diagnosing HIT starts off at the clinic where there's a high suspicion, but then you move into confirming it in the lab. And I'm, I want to quickly describe two different tests involved in HIT, and they're the immunoassays and the functional assays. Immunoassays are based on detecting how much antibody is in our circulation. Uh, basically, you put down the antigen, which is PF4 heparin complexes in a 96 well plate. You add diluted sample, diluted blood sample from patients, and then you wash it away and you ask how much IgG antibody is specific to this PF4 heparin complexes. 
these, these, these assays are very sensitive, greater than 90%, but their biggest problem is that they have a low sense specificity, which can be as low as 40%, depending on the format of the assay you're using. This is great because these assays are great at ruling out HIT. However, people that do not have HIT have antibodies against PF4, and so this assay will lead to overcalling the disease. The gold standard for testing for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia are functional assays, and the serotonin release assay, which we developed by our group several decades ago, is the most studied functional assay for HIT. And it's based on, it follows the pathophysiology of HIT. So basically you take wash platelets, you add patient sera, and increasing amounts of therapeutic doses of heparin to the test, and you see platelet activation, which is usually measured with us by the release of radioactive serotonin. These assays, the functional assays, are difficult to perform in, in, uh, regular, in, in uh, medical centers and uh, uh, laboratories. And that's why when you, when you scout the world for people who can perform these assays, you'll find a few uh, sites in the U.S., something like three or four sites in the U.S., only one here in Canada. We're the only the lab that can do it in Canada. A couple in Germany, one in France, uh, and, and one in Australia. So there's less than 10 labs in the world that can perform these assays, which is the problem when we get to VIT. So VIT, so several, a few years ago, two or three years ago, we actually uh, modified the serotonin release assay where we started adding exogenous PF4 to the assay instead of exogenous heparin. And all we were trying to do is improve the sensitivity of this assay for uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia because the sensitivity is anywhere between 90 to 98. And we, we noticed that we kind of missed 5% of hit patients with this assay. But when you add PF4, you detect those. And sure enough, we just shelved that assay because we, re we weren't really using it uh, until, um, uh, fortunately for us and for the world, uh, this assay turned out to, the, the PF4-based uh, serotonin release assay turned out to be the gold standard for testing uh, for the VIT, VIT disease. And so how was VIT discovered? Well, when the incidence of clotting uh, started in Europe for, following the vaccination with the AstraZeneca, the groups uh, suspected that maybe this is HIT. It's not uh, an unknown disease, and they tested for it. Uh, actually, they tested to rule out HIT because patients showed up with clotting, they were administered some heparin. Um, so quickly, they wanted to test and say, okay, this is not HIT. Let's, let's make sure this is not HIT. And when they tested, lo and behold, they actually found anti-PF4 heparin antibodies, uh, sorry, anti-PF4 antibodies in these patients, and they can activate platelets, which was kind of weird because we weren't expecting that to appear. Um, so here's a study by Marie Scully from the UK. She looked at 23 patients who, were, uh, who had thrombosis and thrombocytopenia roughly five to 30 days after vaccination with AstraZeneca. And what she was able to see is they had high levels of anti-PF4 antibodies. And this started to sound like an anti-PF4 dependent syndrome, similar to HIT. Of course, at the time, the exact nature of these antibodies was unknown, but they identified that it's IgG. And you can see from these two patients right here from this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, on the left side, you have a study patient that when you just add the patient serum to uh, the platelets, you get platelet activation with no heparin. When you add heparin, you get a slight inhibition in platelet activation. That's the middle, um, uh, the middle uh, panel on the left. And then when you add high levels of heparin, you, above, you, you, you get rid of the platelet activation. And that's, that's known because heparin will break up complexes and mop up, um, mop up the uh, antibodies and PF4, mop up the PF4. In the control patient, which is actually a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia patient, you see a classical platelet activation that we see with uh, HIT. On the left side, you see just patient sera, not too much platelet activation in the top right quadrant of the, uh, of the um, uh, figure. And then in the middle right here, you see when you add heparin, you get a lot of platelet activation. And with high heparin, you block the platelet activation. <clears throat> and, this, and, that, and that study was also reported by Andreas Greinacher from Germany and by uh, um, a third uh, group up in uh, the Nordic. So our group uh, through the, uh, through the um, 
the the plate immunology subcommittee of the uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Metastasis uh, quickly released recommendations for lab laboratory diagnosis and patient management. And the clinical picture should guide management and laboratory investigation. You get thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. This might indicate that this patient has fit right after the vaccination happens. And the management should be initiated with a non-heparin anticoagulant. And the reason being is, is its close proximity to heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. To confirm the diagnosis, if there's access to an ELISA-based assay, you should use that considering the functional assays are not uh, readily available. However, the gold standard is the, uh, the uh, functional assays uh, that we use in HIT. Um, if, uh, if, if VIT testing is positive and the, and the diagnosis is confirmed, the non-heparin anticoagulation should be used, and there should be a consideration for high-dose IVIG. And the IVIG was confirmed by our group, where in this study in the New England Journal of Medicine, we uh, fall, and this is early when, um, early during the onset of this uh, clotting disease started, we took three patients with a fit um, that we've confirmed in the lab. They were given anti different anticoagulation, but they got IVIG as an adjunct treatment. And this was, and this is obviously based on our knowledge with heparin induced thrombocytopenia. And the, uh, the IVIG used as an adjunct allows platelet count recovery. As you can see in the left figure, you get a nice platelet count recovery uh, as the IVIG is administered. And you get coagulation factors decreasing, such as uh, a drop in D-dimer, which is an indication of clotting resolution in these patients. Also, the addition of IVIG inhibited the platelet activation mediated by patients in the in the, uh, in the uh, laboratory test using the serotonin release assay. And what you see here is um, several lines, the, the lines represent different times post IVIG. The, the, the dark circles are pre uh, IVIG treatment. And as the patient got more and more IVIG, you can see a drop in platelet activation. Now keep in mind, that did not indicate that the platelet activating antibodies disappeared. It's just indicating that the patient has a lot of IVIG in their system. And IVIG is just a high dose IgG in your body that will compete with these immune complexes at binding the, um, the FC receptor and inhibiting platelet activation, which is the mechanism of platelet activation in these patients. And of course, I'm really gonna go quickly through this, but clinically um, a, a definite VIT would have onset of symptom five to 30 days after vaccination. Uh, there's presence of evidence for the presence of, presence of thrombosis, the thrombocytopenia with a platelet count less than 150, D-dimer levels over 4,000. And of course, to confirm it finally, it's an anti-PF4 antibody that is present. In, in this case, ELISA's, but more importantly, confirm it with, uh, with um, <clears throat> a functional assay. So there are a lot of formats of, of assays out there and tests that you can go looking for uh, VIT antibodies, which are used for heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia. So several groups went out there and just got commercial assays to see which ones work the best, considering functional assays are not available all over the world. And, and you know, this, this, uh, this study right here shows the use of uh, ELISAs that detect antibodies. And what you can, what, what the message from this study was, and because, because these assays actually have different formats of the anti PF4 antigen, some with uh, heparin, some with polyvinyl sulfate, some with different uh, polyanions, their performance characteristics were all over the place. And the conclusion of this study is that the ELISA-based assays will, will regularly miss, will, will regularly, depending on the assay, will regularly miss VIT samples, and they recommended the use of functional assays, which is what I uh, just uh, previously mentioned. Another format of assays that are used for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia that were tested for VIT are uh, rapid assays. These are, these are the ones on the left. These are quick 10, 15-minute uh, assays to detect if these antibodies exist. And lo and behold, the rapid version of the ELISAs are very bad. They miss almost all uh, VIT samples. And the reason being we think, and, uh, and we published it in our Nature paper, is that the uh, antigen, and I'm going to talk about it, uh, is very important to uh, 
you know, when you have the antigen with uh, polyanions, it blocks the binding of the antibodies and you don't detect them. That said, you could see in this study, when you use the ser standard serotonin release assay on the left, which has heparin in it, you don't get great reactivity. But when you use the one on the right, which is the PF4-based uh, serotonin release assay, you get much more reactivity. And therapeutic doses of heparin do inhibit this uh, assay. So heparin is not good to be in the assay. We did it. Uh, a study. So we're the we're the only center in Canada that is uh, that received uh, these samples, the VIT samples for diagnosis. So we have a lot of them. We received about 175 cases. 42 were confirmed. And when you compare the confirmed using the gold standard PF4 SRA, you can see that actually the assay we use in our lab, which has a lot of PF4 in it. Uh, the, the ELISA assay, it has a sensitivity of 100%, so it's pretty good. You just have to select the right EIA. The specificity is a little bit lower. Uh, this is uh, that 93.3%. Those two samples, our control group for specificity was Pfizer and Moderna vaccinated patients who did have uh, play the activating antibodies. And we're still trying to figure out those ones. There's very, very rare cases of VIT associated with Pfizer and Moderna, um, to our knowledge. So uh, we took a, a molecular biology and biochemistry approach to try to understand why these antibodies in VIT uh, are different than HIT. And in our uh, publication in Nature, we used alanine scanning mutagenesis, where we took PF4 and we created 70 different versions of PF4 with a single mutation at every single amino acid, where we converted the amino acids to alanine. And if they were alanine, we changed them to uh, valine. And what happens is that you lose that amino acid's effect on the binding of the antibody. And then we tested all 70 against uh, five VIT patients and 10 HIT patients. And what we were able to show in this study that the VIT patients, all five of them, the antibodies were very restricted. And when we mapped them on PF4, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor right here, the red section is where heparin binds. So the antibodies are very restricted and they bind to the heparin site. So there's a competition there, which is what we were seeing in the assays. Unlike HIT, all 10 HIT patients had antibodies that bound to the blue section here, which is distant from the heparin site. And some of the HIT patients had two different types of poly, uh, poly specific uh, antibodies that bound distant from the heparin site and some that bound at the heparin site. So this explains to us why the VIT patients had antibodies that can actually complex PF4 because they bind to the site where heparin binds and we know heparin can complex PF4. Uh, more interestingly, there were eight amino acids that were, uh, that were the most prominent amongst the VIT patients. Four out of those eight were actually amino acids that directly bound to heparin. Sorry so, to interrupt, Isaac. Uh, this is a two minute warning. All right, thank you. I'm going to try to uh, go right through these. Okay, so when we looked at these five patients, bottom in blue, you have HIT patients. They activate with and without heparin and with PF4. The VIT patients on top, A and B. On the left, you have heparin mediated. There's no real good plate activation. When you add PF4, you get a lot of plate activation, which is very, very interesting, which was very, very interesting when we saw this. Uh, our antibody mapping, which suggested that there's a competition with PF4 and uh, uh, between, PF between the anti-PF4 antibodies from VIT and, and heparin, was confirmed in the EIA when you add therapeutic doses of heparin to the bio to, to in the EIA, uh, you will see immediate inhibition of the VIT antibodies from binding PF4, even at therapeutic doses, which normally in which normally in HIT you don't see it unless you add very high levels of heparin. Um, one very important aspect of binding, you need to be a strong antibody, high avidity, to be able to complex PF4 on your own without heparin. We were able to show with the antibodies that there's, the antibodies were very, had high, high, uh, high uh, binding ability to PF4 without heparin when compared to heparin, uh, HIT hit antibodies and the dissociation rate was very, very slow. So these antibodies can stick and not fall off. We also have DLS data, dynamic light scattering data, which I'm not showing here, that shows the antibodies can form these aggregates without heparin. 
So in summary, this study offers an explanation for how VIP-mediated plate activation occurs. Uh, VIP patients in our study demonstrated similar antibody characteristics that bound PF4 at the same site as heparin. VIP antibodies form immune complexes without the addition of heparin. They activate platelets. We know that through the FC receptor on the platelets, we can inhibit them with IVIG, which was a great indication that this is an adjunct treatment. It's so good to slow down the platelet activation so the other anticoagulants can play the role and, uh, and uh, potentially save these patients. And we did notice that the number of the mortality rate dropped significantly once we started uh, understanding the disease, which happened very quickly. Luckily for, uh, for everybody, um, our knowledge on heparin-induced thrombocytopenia helped a lot. Of course, uh, none of this work would be uh, accomplished without the great research team, my collaborators, and there's never science that uh, can happen without the great funding that comes from uh, our funding agencies. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you uh, so much, Isaac. Um, I'll start off with a couple of questions. Can you comment quickly on the prevalence of VIT versus HIT? And can you comment on whether there are, what are the known or whether there are known factors that predispose a patient to either one? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent, excellent question. And it's been, it's been a matter of a lot of discussions worldwide. Uh, we do not know of any predisposing conditions that can indicate whether you're going to get hit or vit. So um, there's, there was uh, early claims from, from, from the UK, of course, suggested that females, mid-aged females are, are more, most susceptible to or more of a highest risk. But of course, that was very skewed because when AstraZeneca started being used over there, it was being administered to healthcare workers. And that's pretty much dominated by uh, mid-aged females. And then that shifted when we came to Canada, when, when it, this started in Canada, although our numbers are way lower than uh, uh, other places, given our, uh, the number of uh, people we have here, we started uh, seeing that uh, you know, older folks, the younger folks, uh, males, females, we're all getting it. Uh, in fact, in Canada, when we started seeing this, our data is the one that drove. Uh, so at first, uh, AstraZeneca was old, only be, being given to older folks and not mid -age, not mid-aged people, especially females. But once we started seeing it appearing in everybody at the same rate, uh, the recommendation changed that it could just be administered to everybody and it's not restricted to uh, older folks. So, and similarly happens with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia. There is really no um, underlying cause that can indicate you would get hit. Uh, the frequency of hit, of course, can be compared to VIT because not as many people in the world get heparin as been vaccinated with uh, the adenoviral vectors. And you know, even in VIT, when you look scour it through the world, and Johnson and Johnson, you know, when you compare them to each other, the numbers are all over the place. Here in Canada, last I checked, is it was one in fifty-five thousand. In the UK, it started off at one in a million, dropped to one in two hundred thousand. In the Nordic, they were they were they were not, not claiming it was good data, uh, saying that it was one in twenty-five thousand. So it's kind of all over the place, and we really don't know. Uh, what the factor is, because the denominator is not really known very well all over the place. So uh, it, it's a it's a it's a great question, but it's still a matter of um, um, uh, under under investigation, trying to understand it more. And can you comment? Why do you think that this seems not to be seen with the the mRNA vaccines? <clears throat> Again. Uh, it, it, Tough question to answer. We don't know yet. Uh, it's one of two things. It's one of several things, but I mean, some of them are your, the, the, the vehicle in both are different. Obviously the adenoviral vectors, um, there's some data out there that is suggesting PF4 does bind the surface of the adeno more than it would bind the surface of the, the fat bomb that is used to actually transport the mRNA-based uh, vaccines. Uh, the adeno are more pro-inflammatory. That could be heightening the immune response and the appearance of anti-PF4 antibodies or B cells. So it's not really known just yet. Uh, there's a lot of theories out there. Uh, we're working with AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson to try to figure, help them figure that that out. 
uh, the reality is this is very important. But at the same time, we're working also downstream, trying try to solve the clotting event because AstraZeneca and J and J are going nowhere if we plan on vaccinating the entire world to get out of this pandemic. So we need those vaccines. We need to make them safer. We need to increase the confidence in them, and we need to deal with the clotting events that could occur um, when uh, they're administered. 